I'm Sarah Hackenberg. I am uh, Vice Chair of the Academic Senate, and it is my very, very great pleasure to introduce our faculty retreat keynote speakers to you. Um, when we came up with the idea of community as the theme for our 2016-17 faculty retreat, we thought it would be really great if we used the keynote as a way to highlight some of the wonderful projects that are coming out of our various thriving communities here at San Francisco State. Um, the four areas of community that kept coming up in our conversations and brainstorming sessions were teaching communities, research communities, our immediate campus community, and also San Francisco State in the larger community, Bay Area nation world. Um, and all of our speakers today um, are a part of our immediate San Francisco State community, and all will point to the ways in which each of these areas of community necessarily and vibrantly intersect with each other. Um, but that said, we have asked um, we, we're trying to hit each of those four areas with our speakers. So we've asked uh, Amy Kilgard, who is a co-director of the new uh, Teaching and Learning Commons, to start us off with teaching communities. Um, Letitia Marquez Mag Magana, uh, to, uh, who is the director of the SF Build at SFSU, to continue with research communities. Christina Sabi, coordinator of the Conflict Resolution Certificate, to speak to our immediate campus community. And Catherine Kudlick and Emily Batex, director and associate director of SFSU's Longmore Institute to speak uh, to San Francisco State in our larger community. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers um, at slightly greater length before um, they speak, but we'll hold our questions until the very end. And at the end, we'll hopefully have about 10 minutes for questions. We have a new... Uh, catch box thing, which means that I may be throwing this at you if you want to ask a question and you just sort of speak into it. Um, so we'll try that out. Um, and I also wanted to note that immediately following this uh, keynote plenary, we're going to, the Teaching and Learning Commons is hosting a dessert reception downstairs on the second floor. So that will be a place where we can continue conversation um, about our speakers today, but also um, the Teaching and Learning Commons is going to ask for feedback um, on the Teaching and Learning Commons. Um, okay, so for our first speaker is Amy Kilgard, who is, as I said, a co-director of the Teaching and Learning Commons. She's co-directing this year with Julia Lewis and Kurt Daw. Um, Amy is a professor of communication studies. Her scholarship, creative work, and teaching exist at the intersections of performance studies, aesthetic methodologies, and pedagogy. She has toured her solo show titled, uh, Tri ah, I, I even wrote it down phonetically, Tri Sky Deck, Tri Triskaidekaphobia, thank you, 13, fear of the number 13, uh, 13 consumer tragedies to universities and festivals around the country. She is also working on expanding her work about chaos as a guiding principle for creative pedagogy. For the last four years, she has been the supervisor for graduate teaching associates and communication studies and the course coordinator for communication 150. She looks forward to working with more faculty as her role in her role as director of the TLC, Teaching and Learning Commons. Thank you, Amy. May I turn this off while I'm speaking? You can. Thank you very much. I thought I was going last, and so I there might be a few references that are a little bit awkward because of that position, but we definitely want to make sure we invite you to the uh, dessert reception afterwards. I, I won't speak completely behind the mic. I know that's bad for the cameras. I'm sorry, I'm a performer, and I, I, I'll speak some here, but when I'm performing, I'm not, not going to. <clears throat> yes. When in doubt, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes to holding hands with the people sitting next to you in the graduate class you're teaching. Yes to maneuvering your way through the postage stamp sized classroom filled with too much furniture. Yes to snaking your way down the labyrinthine halls and down the metal fire stairs and out the institutional door. Yes to bursting out into the unexpected San Francisco sunshine. Yes to the concerned, bemused, too cool students and faculty who you know secretly wish they could join your chain as you trace your way across the rooftop garden of the Student Health Center. Yes, to expanding the chain to take up the whole width of the rooftop. 
yes to expanding and expanding and expanding. Last summer, a group of colleagues reached out to me to ask if I would consider working on the plans for a teaching and learning commons at SF State. Despite being pretty satisfied as a professor in the Communication Studies Department, I mean, I get to teach all of the things I love in a department with fabulous students and staff and faculty, I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to my great good fortune, my colleagues Julia Lewis and Kurt Daw also said yes to helping spend this year as co-directors planning what kind of TLC we would have. In my few minutes here, I will describe how this initiative emerged, where we are in our planning, and what you can do to help us imagine and create the TLC we need and want at SF State. First, a bit of history. During the past several years, a number of institutional and social factors have led to a decline in the support for and perception of the importance of teaching on campus. From a decreasing state budget, to the decentralization of support services, to changing faculty workloads and, and profiles, to changing political landscapes. <laughs> the vibrancy of support for teaching and the perception of great teaching as an institutional value has waned. No one of these factors accounts for the shift completely. However, it's clear from our conversations with many faculty members and staff members and administrators that a shift in perception at least has happened and we need to shift again. <coughs> the plan for the TLC emerged in response to this need with joint support from the Academic Senate, the Academic Affairs, the offices of the Provost and the President. The new TLC, we hope, will provide the platform for a renewed investment in the value of and support for teaching and learning on campus. Let me be clear, great teaching great programs to support teaching and innovative teaching and learning pra practices have been happening throughout all of this time on campus. We've heard about several of them in our earlier panels today and we'll hear about more of them uh, in the panels to come today in our, our presentations here. And with the TLC, a faculty-driven initiative supported by administrative resources and institutional buy-in, we hope to see a renewed sense of the value of teaching and SF State value in our community. During the fall semester, Julia, Kurt, and I have been engaged in what we've been calling our listening tour. Maybe some of you have heard us say this. We've met with a whole <coughs> number of faculty from all of the colleges. We've met with administrators from all of the colleges. We've talked with some of our new faculty colleagues, um, with faculty who work with programs such as the Metro College Success Program, um, with faculty who are working on the Foundations of Excellence Initiative, and we're on several of those committees as well. Uh, we've met with the directors of uh, teaching and learning and, and faculty development centers from CSU campuses uh, other than our own. Um, and we've done all this so that we would have a better sense of the multiple landscapes and contexts that inform this project. Uh, we emerged from our work last semester with a mission statement and a series of questions that we want to ask you, our colleagues, which leads me to the third part of, of my presentation, how you could help. So we've designed an interactive brainstorming activity to accompany dessert, dessert. <laughs> uh, downstairs uh, right immediately following this, this presentation, or this series of presentations. What we want to know from you are, when you dream of the ideal TLC, what words and images and concepts and ideas come to mind? What are you missing that would be most helpful to support your teaching that the TLC might provide? What topics would you most want programming for the TLC to address? What do you want to know about the TLC? And then this is my favorite two-part question. When and how have you felt valued as a teacher at SF State? And when have you felt inspired as a teacher here? We'll use your answers as, uh, uh, to help us as we continue to work this semester to develop the model and plan for the TLC that will open next academic year. In the midst of my work for the TLC last fall, I wrote a performance for a conference presentation at, for the National Communication Studies Association Conference, um, and I performed this last November. The prompt for the panel was to think of a time when performance students teach the teachers, so when I learned from my students. And I thought of a moment 
that I was, when I was particularly inspired. And I wanted to share that with you as you think of your own moments of inspiration. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked me that. What are my expectations for performances in this class? Okay, let me give you an example. The assignment was to create a performance experiment that somehow changes the way we see or experience a space in the humanities building. Use forced entertainment's performance Quizula to inform your performance experiment and uh, create a specific role for the audience. So an emissary from one of the groups sticks his head in the room and beckons for us to follow. So we follow him down the hall and down the stairs to the base of the slowest elevators in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and we wait for the elevator to arrive, and when it does, he ushers us all, the whole class, don't tell the fire marshal, into the elevator, pushes all of the buttons, and then waves. <laughs> and more slowly <laughs> So we're standing there, you know, hands by our side, not speaking, you know, doing what you're supposed to do in an elevator. And we get to the second floor. The doors open. The group is there. Question, answer, tableau. The doors close. Ooh. Oh, oh, excuse me. Oh. We get to the third floor. The doors open. The group is there. Again, question, answer, tableau. The doors close and suddenly people are moving. Can you get out of the way? Did they just run up all the stairs and beat us here? I need to see. Can you just move? <laughs> we get to the fourth floor. The doors open. Question, answer, tableau. The doors close and suddenly it's pandemonium on the elevator. I don't know where the performance is anymore. All the way up and all the way down on each floor, the doors open and everything and everyone on the elevator freezes. It's like we're holding our breaths and until the doors are completely co closed. And then this whole other performance is happening. We're <laughs> moving and breathing and laughing. And none of that is supposed to happen on an elevator. <laughs> They've done it. They've changed the way we see or experience a space in the humanities building. But they've done more than that, too. Now, every elevator is a performance. <laughs> every time the doors open, and every time the doors close, every moment has the possibility for transformation, of transforming the way we know the world. And students taught me that. And now they've ruined it for everyone else. <laughs> that's my expectation. That's my standard. You have to transform the way I know the world with every performance. Oh, don't look at me like that. <laughs> You're the ones who push the buttons. <laughs> well, not you, but you. <laughs> You have the opportunity <laughs> to change the way we know teaching at San Francisco State. So please join us as we imagine and create our teaching and learning commons together. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, Letitia Marquez Magana, is a professor of biology and the director of the Health Equity Research Lab and SF Build. She is the first uh, born daughter of Mexican immigrants and began her education in the US as a monolingual Spanish speaker. She is the first member of her extended US family to complete high school and went on to earn degrees in biology and biochemistry from Stanford and UC Berkeley. She joined the faculty at SF State in 1994 targeting her professional efforts to giving back. 
Upon joining the faculty at SF State, Dr. Marquez Magana initiated a successful research program that led to the training of significant numbers of minority students for biomedical research careers. Since 2007, these students have been engaged in research that links basic science to community health as part of her transition from studies on bacterial genetics to work aimed at achieving health equity. She is also part of a transdisciplinary team, research community, dedicated to investigating the obstacles and facilitators in science and math for groups who continue to be underrepresented in these domains. Thank you. technologically challenged, so I'd rather uh, point at things, and, um, and, uh, and, and I may come in front because I think that the barrier, the artificial barrier is a little bit tricky. But uh, so I, I thank you again for um, the opportunity to speak, and um, I'm going to talk today about our work um, with SF Build to uh, build uh, inclusive research communities. And I really see that as an outcome of some of the student-led actions that took place nearly 50 years ago to change academia into um, an arena where uh, people of color were actually included in academia, where there's, there, uh, there's uh, courses that include their experiences um, to benefit those populations. And so I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Um, I will also, uh, what I'm going to begin with, though, is the need for um, inclusive communities to ensure that uh, teaching and research is better, but I'll be focusing on the research. And so um, I'm going to talk about the national mandate that actually led to the funding of the BUILD grant which um, you'll see was a, it's a very well-funded program with lots to do. So the national mandate, or the crisis, um, it comes from a paper that was published by Hannah Valentine and Francis Collins. Uh, Francis Collins is the currently seated NIH director, and we're hoping, yeah, I heard he's at Trump Tower the other day, but anyway, don't know. And Hannah Valentine is the inaugural office for scientific workforce diversity, and this is the paper that was published um, in 2015, and what I did is pulled out the, the piece that I thought was really important. And so um, what this talks about is that the U.S. biomedical research workforce does not mirror the nation's population, despite numerous attempts to increase diversity. And in fact, it's been millions of dollars to try to do this. And we've been very incremental changes that actually haven't been in line with um, population growth of these groups. This imbalance is limiting the promise of the biomedical workforce for building knowledge, because we know that diversity leads to creativity and innovation, and improving the nation's health. And that's because personal is professional, and so the questions that get asked tend to relate to the individuals that are actually doing the work. And so it's not a surprise that we've made inroads in a lot of the the health disparities or the health outcomes that affect um, more powerful individuals in our society. And, uh, we, and consequently, we haven't dealt with a lot of the things with other groups. And so that's where the health disparities come from. And so we, our partner is uh, UCSF. And this is actually a paper that was published um, from a, uh, a number, a big giant group um, over at UCSF that talked about the diversity in clinical and biomedical research and how that promise has not been fulfilled. They basically did a meta-analysis of all the clinical trials that have taken place and that are funded by NIH to look at who's actually being included in the studies. And what they found, um, which is typical in the cancer clinical trials that I'm aware of, is that about 90 percent of the participants are white Americans. And so um, you'll see that that's a problem for all of us. And so uh, that's, you know, uh, we, there was a talk at a health disparity symposium at UCSF. This is Eliseo Perez Estable, who is the new uh, director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. He was at UCSF for many years, and many of us had the privilege of working with him. And now he's uh, the director, and what he said is we're at a crisis point, and you can read this, that it's not just a social justice issue, it's a common sense issue. We all know that humans, or all humans, come in different varieties, <laughs> and it's really important to understand all that variation in order to benefit all of us, because we're more alike than we are similar, and if we're not including certain groups, then even the groups that are included are not benefiting from those results as well. And so um, the other thing is that there's a, a study that shows that uh, non-minorities are less likely to ask questions about minority communities, and so it's really important if we want to make sure that um, we're benefiting all populations that we have the diversity. And um, I just want to point out that Eliseo was the first person to actually now recognize sexual minorities as a health disparity population. He actually had that purview and he actually did that and I really 
he's he's a he's a cha he's a he's a champion. So I'm really looking forward to working with him. Um, so, but. Before him, um, these kinds of data led to uh, these overarching strategies. And um, uh, Francis Collins has been a big supporter of this with um, his assistant director, Tayback, who is going to keep on while they select. So we'll hope that we'll keep going. Um, but basically, there are three initiatives. And this uh, it, it helps frame what I'll be talking about is the, research, the inclusive research environment. And so there's the BUILD initiative. There are 10 campuses. We are one of those campuses. And we are partnered with UCSF. Um, we're the only one that has a single partner, and we're the one that's partnered um, in my, with the most prestigious NIH-funded institution. They're the second best funded, um, and so everybody else, we have the, we have the, um, the, the challenge and the benefit of being partnered with somebody that's, they're expecting us to change them out. So anyway, um, <laughs> just to say that out loud. Okay, so then there's the National Research Mentoring Network, which is really, um, if you haven't, uh, Heard about that? Google it. It's basically a way to pr uh, m uh, provide matching, like a match.com, for students who maybe don't have uh, mentors that they can talk to. Um, I don't think that's the case necessarily here. We can do a better job, but we have m more, more people here. And then there's the Coordination Evaluation Center, which is actually taking all the information collected from all these sites and uh, doing analysis, meta-analysis, um, site-level analysis to really see what works for whom and in what context. It's a $200 million initiative over five years. We have $17 million of that, and um, we're hoping to recompete and so I, for an additional five years. So at our last annual grantees meeting, we actually talked about uh, inclusive science. And I'm going to show the framework that was presented and modify it in a little bit so we can think about inclusive research. And so this is the framework that was presented by uh, Dr. Silvia Hurtado. She's at UCLA. And she talked about inclusive science. And inclusive science has various elements, curriculum, institutional actions, partnerships, and training. Um, and so I'm specifically going to be talking about research. And um, what I, uh, these elements include things like making sure that there's diverse representation, that um, these innovations happen because of the, 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 the diversity and that they actually address diverse populations, that there's a good climate for it that there's connections to diverse communities, um, that, it's, that the training is done in a culturally responsive way, and that uh, the ultimately race, gender, and science identities are integrated. You know, so that a scientist, like when I walk in the room, people are, hey, that's a scientist. That hasn't happened very often. But um, just to say that, that, that you know, I do know now in biology, I actually, the students like, recognize me as a scientist, which is super cool. So um, that's the thing that we want to do. Okay, so our theory of action is in the next slide. And um, basically, we have the SAFE model, a signaling affirmation for equity. And what I'll show, and I'll step over here, is that we're using a multi-level approach where we're working both um, at many levels, at the student level, at the faculty level, and at the institutional level, to basically reach these outcomes here, which include um, increased uh, intent to pursue a biomedical research career persistence and engagement in professional societies as change agents or agents of change. This is more focused to science, but I think this is true for any domain where diversity is important, which I would say is all domains. And so what we're focusing on is increasing knowledge of stereotype threat and tools to combat it and affirming goals to give back in science, which we know that a lot of our students who come here are interested in uh, doing just that in order to increase these kinds of um, psychosocial factors. Self-efficacy, the belief that you can do something well, science identity, which uh, you know, is uh, self-explanatory, and sense of belonging, which I was having a conversation with other people, and how sense of belonging is really what you need to engender in a classroom and in a research environment to be inclusive. And so um, what I'll tell you about is our efforts now to um, better understand what's going on with this and to study it. So uh, this is part of our illuminating pathway study that took place um, in spring 2016. Um, I don't see Allegra here, but Allegra Irreira Velas uh, did this work with Mika Estrada and our psychology students. So it's a transdisciplinary group um, of basic scientists, psychologists, social psychologists, and science educators. We had 706 participants. You can see the number that are underrepresented and non-underrepresented. Uh, non and 50% of these are biology majors. So this is definitely set in College of Science and Engineering. And we had a 20-minute online survey. Pre and post to, or not, yeah, be pre and post, but anyway, I'm not going to show that, uh, to talk about um, some of these psychosocial factors. And what I'm going to share is one result and how that uh, enters into our thinking about the SAFE model. And then I'll talk about how that now works into some of our ideas around building a research inclusive community. So um, I'm going to talk about microaffirmations. So these are defined as apparently small acts or events, 
often hard to see, that are public and private, often unconscious, which occur wherever people wish to help others to succeed. And it actually, I mean, isn't that lovely? I just love that. And so um, it actually comes out of a, uh, a study done at MIT um, by an economist. And so um, different perspectives always lead to really great understandings. And so uh, what we have done is to take that paper and to come up with a scale, a measure, that we're now looking at our own students and asking how they experience their uh, classrooms and research environments in terms of the affirmations that they get about who they are in the domain that they're in as a, individually and as in a group. And so what I want to share with you that was really exciting is that in terms of the groups that I talked about, the chemists who are biology majors as well, there's no difference in the number of microaffirmations that are uh, reported by non-URM and URM. Okay. There are no difference between the number of microaffirmations that URM and non-URM are experiencing or reporting on the scale in, the you know, in chemistry bio you know, biology people. Okay, I thought that was astonishing. I see some people going, wow, yeah, it is astonishing. I would predict that if we did the same study at like where I trained, um, like Berkeley in particular, um, that would not be the result. And so uh, that's, we, we don't have those data. We're starting to roll those out to see. Um, and we want to actually look now, what are the mediators uh, that uh, are you know, involved in this, these, uh, this kind of um, idea of microaffirmations micro being important. What I want to say as an aside, um, UC Santa Cruz did collect um, microaggressions on their campus and showed it geospatially and it was interesting. But the thing that was in, when they talked to the students, those that were involved in that process, they felt isolated, they felt marginalized. That's the outcome of it. And so I'm like, well, let's not do that. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's record microaffirmations because then my hypothesis is that they would feel included, they would feel a sense of belonging, they would feel, so I think that's what we're gonna you know, keep working on. So coming back to this, um, what we're starting to do is to actually move away maybe from some of this thinking and really think about how do we create an affirming kind environment. And um, in fact, the workshop that I led uh, you know, earlier, we were talking about some of that. How do we just make sure that we all say we know it's a hard time and we really, uh, people are experiencing it in different ways and we care about all the ways that people are experiencing it. I mean, for many of us it's really hard, but some people, honestly maybe happy about what's going on. And so it's different, you know, and it's, it's, it is. And so we care about everybody's experiences. And so let's work together and think about ways to, and I'm looking forward to Christina's presentation um, about how to deal with the conflict that may be coming from the different ways that people are perceiving the same environments. But anyway, we're working with creating affirming environments. And I'll just show you a mediation work. Um, is that uh, this is uh, what we're looking at is microaffirmations and whether it's mediated by science identity how much you feel like you are considered a scientist and that you endorse the values of the scientific community. And this is really hard to see, but um, basically there is a connection between microaffirmations and intent to pursue a degree, which is not surprising. And if you look at microaffirmations and science identity, there's definitely a connection. Um, it's point, you know, point two three. this is linear regression. But there's a greater connection between science identity and intent to pursue. And in fact, when you um, control for this, and I was telling some of the biochemists, it's like an enzymatic reaction, products going, you know, substrates going to products, and it's sort of an enzyme, so anyway, but it's not really an enzyme, because it's not catalytic, it's not catalytic, but basically for all the other social scientists, this is playing a role, you know, and it's, and it's a, and it's a, it knocks it down by two-thirds, so it's an important role, but this is the, the piece that's really interesting. Um, if you look at all participants and then you look at URM versus non-URM, what you can see is that it's a big role for all participants, but that number is largely driven by the non-URM, where science identity is very strongly linked to intent to pursue. And in fact, when you take this out, it really drops the microaffirmations approach. So then we don't know what that is. But maybe the microaffirmations as they're experiencing is really endorsing the science identity of the students that maybe already have that identity pretty strong. That's one way to interpret it. Um, with underrepresented minority students, you can see there's less of a connection, and it's not as, there's still a significant mediating effect, but it's not so much. What I think is going on is that the science values that are being um, measured here are the values to advance knowledge, to publish, and have grants, you know, to satisfy your curiosity, which is, came out of key informant interviews of Scripps Institute um, biomedical researchers, and yet, like, the reason I went into science was to give back. And so that's not in my, you know, and so I think in a lot of students, so I think by affirming those values, we're going to increase it. 
So I'm going to now talk about some of the levels that we're doing, tell you about the build team, and then end so I, to be on time. So we're doing institutional transformation, faculty instructor transformation, and student transformation. What I want to focus at the institutional level primarily is because that's where we have these uh, transdisciplinary teams. We have a social ped justice pedagogy group. Some of them are here, and it's largely based in HSS, and they're developing actually um, pedagogy to um, increase social justice content in research skills and bio and statistics courses um, with the idea that that'll mitigate some of the stereotype threat because people will, okay, and everybody's not in their head. So, but this is paradigm shifting, just so that you know. Um, then we're doing uh, actually funding opportunities for transdisciplinary cross-institutional research on local issues. So that's with UCSF. And so we want to specifically engage students in research that addresses some of the local health issues. Um, I just want to focus on the faculty agents of change. We're actually doing research. We're implementing changes in our classrooms that fit within the SAFE model. And then we're looking, um, parent, uh, working with psychologists and to look at how it's affecting psychosocial factors. So it's really the power of having a lot of different minds on it. And so, um, oops, this is, this is the team, the leadership team. And what I'll just say is cross-institutional, SF State, UCSF. You can see it's multi-ethnic, different genders, different departments. We have Africana Studies, Chem Biochem, Chemistry, Health Education, Geography and the Environment. And then these folks are um, in different departments over UCSF. So it, it, um, it can work. I could say, I, I'll tell you, the communication cost is significant, but the benefit is just really outstanding. And then I'll finish up with a summary going back to this, is that now what we're thinking is that um, San Francisco State is really fitting into this that was generated, okay, Div participation of diverse researchers. Um, our demographics mirror the nation's demographics. Uh, integrated race, gender, and science identities. Um, we are validating classroom and research experiences you know, by including social justice in the research that gives back. Um, and we're actually studying that. And then uh, culturally responsive practice, we're working with UCSF primarily to develop culturally aware mentoring training. And Katista and I will be working with some of that, as well as Blake Riggs. And then um, connections with diverse communities. We are the city's university. And so it's nice to be able to do that with UCSF potentially through this. And SFDP, SFDPH and SFHIP, a bunch of things that we're working with. Um, affirming the kind environment. I think that I just love that. and. Um, Ultimately, diversity and innovations is scholarship by, with, and for people of color, and it, you know, and all people. So why is that important? Organizational change management theory says that you need to anchor transformation in the history and the mission of the institution you're trying to change. And if we all remember, this is the legacy of the student-led actions that were supported by staff and faculty. If you guys get a chance, see the Agents of Change documentary. Um, it resulted in the only College of Ethnic Studies, but it also re resulted in teaching and research on this campus that's of, on people of color, by people of color, for people of color. And I think that's what we need to do in biomedical research in order to really make sure that the NIH, which is funded by all our taxpayer dollars, is actually you know, benefiting all the people that pay into it. And so I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, Christina Sabi, has been a professor in the Communication Studies Department since 2002 in the CSU, serving her first five years as an assistant professor at San Jose State. Her research and teaching interests are in strategic interpersonal communication and conflict resolution. And she co-founded the Campus Civility Office and Mediation Program at San Jose State, also participating as a facilitator in the campus-wide Difficult Dialogues Initiative. Christina has developed conflict resolution curriculum at both SJSU and SFSU and currently coordinates the conflict resolution certificate program here at SFSU. This year she's excited to be working with the Academic Senate and her colleagues in communication studies on promoting positive and productive conversations about difficult issues around campus. Hello. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. Thanks for the invitation. Um, one of the first things I wanted to do is to try to frame uh, what I want to talk about in uh, conflict and dialogue uh, by asking two questions and asking you to think through uh, your answers to these questions. Uh, the first is I'd like you all to think about a disagreement or an argument that you've had lately that was upsetting. <laughs> what a great way to start out a talk, right? <laughs> so. Perhaps you've had one of these. And I'd like you to think to yourself, what were the most prominent feelings that you had? 
while that argument was going on. In the interests of time, I'm not going to ask each of you to reflect on that, although that would be a great exercise, and I would like to do that at a later time. Um, but if any of you had feelings of hurt, not being heard, voicelessness, or powerlessness in that argument, and that contributed to its being upsetting for you, um, you would be in the same boat as a lot of other people who reflect on that kind of question. Now the second question I'd like to ask you, and you might be able to anticipate this, is to think about a disagreement that you've had that wasn't upsetting. I find that people have a difficult time thinking of those kinds of disagreements. Although honestly, you're probably having them all the time, you're just not thinking about it as a disagreement. You're having productive conversations with people, productive conversations in which you feel heard, in which you feel affirmed, perhaps uh, contributing to some microaffirmations, in which you feel like you have a voice and you feel empowered to say what you mean. And if you can imagine a conversation like that, in which you didn't originally agree with the person that you were talking about, then we're talking about a really positive disagreement, a positive conversation. Um, and that's what I'd like to focus on today, is how can we, can we create positive conversations around difficult topics, topics that are not originally the kinds of things that we might want to engage with people. Um, what I'd like to also focus on is, I think especially because of the environment that we found ourselves in last semester, um, you know, whether or not you find yourself on the right or the left in terms of politics, people were upset, uh, people felt divided. And uh, there's a lot of focus on what we think of as positions and positionalities. What are your position? What do you believe? What's going on with you? Um, and I want to point out that uh, from almost everything that I've read in conflict resolution, focusing on positions and positionalities in particular is a win-loss strategy. And that should make some sense to you. If I'm focusing on my position, I want to win my position. I want to tell you why I'm right. So there's four things I'd like to point out about that. One is someone always loses in a win-loss strategy. Sometimes more than one person loses. Sometimes everyone does. The second is that it feeds a competitive framework. So if you want that, great. And I was a competitive debater for a long time. Sometimes that's fun. Um, sometimes it's not. The third is that it inherently separates the two people who are talking. And the fourth is that think about what you want to do if you want to win. So you talk over the other person. You talk louder than the other person. You make yourself heard more and better than they are. And that's part of what contributes to that competitive nature. We could continue doing that at San Francisco State. But I'd like to ask the question, how can we engage more collaboratively at San Francisco State? And so uh, one of the first points here is to discuss what the division of the country is and how that is reflected at San Francisco State University, because our campus just reflects what's going on in the United States. And so one, I'd like you to think about people who, when they don't feel heard, what they're doing. And it might be that they're shouting louder. And you might have seen some of that happening in your classes. I saw people coming out of classes in tears, people not being able to finish, instructors coming out so frustrated from their classes this fall because people were having conversations that they didn't really know how to manage, and they didn't have the skill set to do that. Um, and in part, it's because we're not listening to each other, we're shouting louder. Uh, the second is when you hear something that you don't like, Maybe you just shut it off. Have you heard that before? Well, if you don't like listening to that, then just don't listen. If you don't like watching that program, just turn it off. Turn it down. Um, the third thing that we do uh, when division is created is that, um, and a lot of conflict uh, resolution theorists theorize, that it's actually a lack of listening, that the fact that we're turning it off, that we're turning it down, that has contributed to the current division because it so easily separates us. So how can we listen when we have strong beliefs? That is really difficult. If I really, really believe things strongly, and I do, and I might even disagree with some of you about some stuff, what do I do to be able to have those strong beliefs and still listen to you? And there are a number of tenets that come from uh, what we call a dialogue, or a, an idea of public dialogue, that uh, help us to think through how can we actually have those conversations. Uh, and the first thing I would say is that in conversations when you have strong beliefs, when you can work collaboratively, the first thing that you do actually is you hold your ground. You don't give that up. You hold your ground and keep your passion while, first of all, telling your story in a way that recognizes others' perspectives. Presume that there are actually good reasons that other people have the perspectives that they have. Allow space for others to express those things. 
honor the experiences that bring you to this moment, which are obviously different from where other people have come. And finally, believe that it's actually possible to remain open to others without undermining yourself and your own beliefs. That is challenging. That is not easy. Just because I tell you that you might have to do those things does not mean that we all have the skills to do it. And I certainly struggle with that on a daily basis. But it's one of the things that I would like us to work toward as a community. The second tenant of dialogue that I think that we can work toward as a community is being open. Being open. Not just having an open personality, listening to other ideas, but really being a genuinely present in conversations with people. Giving our attention and really listening to other people, whether or not we want to hear what they have to say. Showing our curiosity about others' experiences, even if they conflict with ours. And this, I think, is particularly hard. When you are cringing just to listen to that person that you really don't agree with, that in many ways what they're saying is kind of offending you, how do you ask them more questions to learn more about how they got to the place where they are? But if we don't ask those questions, we're not going to get past uh, some of the division that we've created. To D, allow others to tell their stories without trying to change them. Because they've had their own experiences and they've had their own stories and it's not about us telling them how they had it. And E, how do we let people know that we heard them and can we continue to do that in a way that doesn't alienate them and doesn't sort of bring our own position into the, into, uh, the fray. So I talked uh, so about holding our ground, being open, but then the final uh, part that I think that we need to do as uh, part of being in a collaborative community is remaining in the tension. We are always going to exist in this tension and especially as folks that work at an institution such as ours, we need to remain in that tension. We need to have so many different things going on and to be able to facilitate those things. And so working on holding differing ideas with people and perhaps differing ideas in our own minds and Maybe they're even contradictory in our own minds. How do we do that simultaneously? I know the psychologists have some ideas about what, uh, uh, what people do when, they, when that happens, but, um, but can we strive for that? Can we strive to hold contradictory ideas? Um, can we explore others ground, like I was talking before, before jumping into our own ground? Can we say, uh, you know, yeah, I understand that you think that, and I'm gonna ask you some questions, but let me tell you why I'm right. <laughs> um, how can we remain curious? Uh, without needing to kind of come back to where we are. And finally, how can we differentiate our affirmation of a person from our opinions about their beliefs and attitudes? Uh, because there are lots of things that I am just never going to be okay with that people tell me they believe. How do I affirm that person and their place in my community uh, and still disagree with them uh, respectfully? Well, like I said, this isn't going to be easy, but I really like the idea that um, the Academic Senate and Communication Studies are planning to work together in this next semester to promote dialogue practice within the academy, within San Francisco State. Not to just tell you what to do, but to try to practice that, to try to work toward uh, creating a collaborative community as much as we can. And so the three things that I hope that we really accomplish over the year, or, or over the semester, and then hopefully going on to other years, are A, exploring the needs of our community. What do we really need as a community to continue our collaboration? Learning about each other and discovering our differences and shared concerns. And in a lot of ways, we might know that there's different ideas, we might know that there's different opinions across campus, but how do we really learn about people and the concerns that they share that are perhaps different than ours or even contradictory to ours? Um, and finally, how do we collaborate to promote healthy dialogue exploration of each other and our ideas, and an engaging and empowering community. Uh, one of the wonderful uh, things that, that I've gotten to participate in, both at San Jose State and at San Francisco State, is that I have colleagues in my communication studies department who also have engaged in public dialogue and in conflict management practices. And we all know that having dialogue is not about resolving conflicts. We're not going to resolve anything. Um, this semester, even the next couple of years, and frankly, being a part of the academy, I hope we don't resolve our conflicts. I hope we continue to have these conversations and we continue to 
push our buttons and think through all we can um, to explore who we are and, um, and our communities. And so I really hope that you will join with us as we go and do that over the next semester. And um, if anybody has any questions or interests, please, please uh, let me, anybody on the Academic Senate know or in Communication Studies. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speakers today are Katherine Kudlik and Emily Smith Batix. After two decades at the University of California, Davis, Kathy Kudlik became professor of history and director of the Paul K. Long Longmore Institute on Disability at SFSU uh, in 2012. She has published a number of books and articles in disability history, including Reflections, The Life and Writings of a Young Blind Woman in Post-Revolutionary France, and Disability History, Why We Need One Another. Um, which is published in the American Historical Review. She also oversaw completion of Paul Longmore's posthumously published book, Telethons, Spectacle, Disability, and the Business of Charity. She is currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Disability History with Michael Rembis and Kim Nielsen. As director of the Longmore Institute, she directed the public history exhibit, Patient No More, People with Disabilities Securing Civil Rights, and co-hosts the Superfest International Disability Film Festival, both of which engage deeply with local disability communities. Emily Smith Batex received her PhD in 2011 in American Studies with a focus in disability studies from the University of Minnesota. Her dissertation, Building the Normal Body, Disability and the Techno Makeover, examined the cultural stories that circulate around disabled bodies normalized with science and technology. And she has served as the Associate Director of the Longmore Institute since 2012. Um, hi. Um, so thank you. And this has been just such a great day for me. I feel re-energized. I have to confess that I was a little um, uh, anxious about starting the semester. Now I feel I have all these great tools and all this great stuff, including um, fellow panelists today. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Longmore Institute in general. And But first, I want to give a little brief Disability 101. For those of you that haven't given disability much thought, it's um, a group of scholars and activists and artists and all sorts of people are thinking about disability as a category of human experience, much like race, class, sexual orientation, minority, discourse, anything. And to really think about disability as a, another way of being in the world and to think about it as a creative, ingenious, um, and exciting force. Um, and what's great about it is it's going to touch everybody um, in some way. So it's not just some little weird thing that's off in a corner um, and people that are uh, you know, so different and everything. But there's all sorts of possibilities for intersection and um, thinking and rethinking everything that we take for granted. And that's kind of the approach that we take at um, the Longmore Institute. Um, how many people knew Paul Longmore um, here on campus? Make a l loud set of noises or something. A lot of people? Yay, hey, all right, yeah. So um, Paul, just for those of you that didn't know and aren't in on the great secret, um, he, was a, he was a force of nature on campus. He was a history professor, a polio survivor, a scholar activist, a flirt, a articulate, sharp, uh, funny, uh, amazing scholar, and uh, wrote in a number of different areas and was very much beloved on campus campus. He um, had the ear of the president. He, he scooted around this quad in his wheelchair. And he was just kind of this force that everybody knew. And when he died unexpectedly in 2010, um, the university community really came together to mourn him by celebrating his legacy. He had formed this thing called the Institute on Disability that he ran sort of as a research entity that, that um, you know, did brought in some government funding and, you know, but it was a one man operation. And the university saw all sorts of potential there and they brought him uh, to life basically by honoring his memory and naming the institute for him, the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability and recruiting for a national uh, direct, or director nationally, um, they got me. Um, and then I recruited for my associate director, um, Emily. And uh, so we, we started in 2012 in earnest in the new sort of incarnation. And the, our aim really is to do uh, research on campus and or, or outreach on campus. Um, and bring together different groups on campus, but also to bring 
together community partnerships as well. And that's, we're known as a research service organization. Um, and I don't know how many people know that lingo on campus. If you run one and you're a director, you know about it. They're called RSOs. And the idea is that we are supposed to be bringing together the scholarship and the activism and the excitement of what it's like to be at a university, but to do it with community partnerships and with community um, groups and to really explore these things. So I feel very fortunate because I've worked with um, a number of people, we both have, um, uh, and uh, really done a number of really exciting, ex uh, fascinating things. Emily will tell you uh, in detail about one of them, but I just wanna mention a couple of our um, overarching programs. One of them, um, we do run the Superfest International Disability Film Festival, which uh, is a really great, um, uh, opportunity for disabled filmmakers and others to showcase disability in a really exciting way as a creative force for for change and excitement and and, and all these things and that's that's one of the the great programs that we run and um, we're starting the judging now we bring in student interns to learn from it and and all of that so it's just a great experience um, the second thing is we um, do the Longmore lecture on disability um, and the next one is coming up, um, will be on February 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. And um, the speaker is Mia Minguez, who's a community activist and organizer um, around disability, um, queer, and um, uh, ethnic minority issues and all sorts of really cool stuff. She's got a lot of, a lot of followers, and so we're very excited about bringing her. Um, another project, and I'm going to put out word now. Um, some of you, you might know who you are, but we have a, uh, I'm working uh, with um, some people on campus to do a, a runway project uh, in May. Uh, and uh, we are looking for models who identify as people with disabilities. Could be faculty. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, students, yes, and or staff. So anybody, if you're interested, you get they're going to design a garment for you in collaboration with you, and uh, you may or may not decide to that you want to be part of the runway project. But it's a whole design process that's really exciting and really innovative. So it's it's definitely very very exciting. Um, the other project that uh, we have been involved in and that Emily will tell us a lot more about is the Patient No More exhibit. So I'll turn it over to Emily. And um, just so you know, uh, Access Note, we have a slide up here on the screen, and it has uh, one image of some of the many amazing photographs that Academic Technology took for us um, at the launch of our exhibit. Um, and it also has all our contact information for the institute. And the important one to know is longmoreinstitute.sfsu.edu, where all the other Twitter or Facebook can be found. Um, so yeah, uh, 2015 was the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And when Kathy and I got started in 2012, Kathy had this great idea to do a historical exhibit that could show disability history and, and teach. Um, a lot of people in the disability community don't know much about their own history. And a lot of people, um, you know, obviously in the public don't know much about it either. And uh, we also just wanted this project to really be something that would put us on the map, show what the Longmore Institute could do, and really show what these community partnerships would look like. Um, so a story that we kept coming back to was from uh, 1973. Um, sorry, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, included a section called Section 504, which is really just a paragraph that said that no federal programs or facilities could discriminate on the basis of disability. And this was the first disability rights, um, civil, uh, civil rights legislation. And it was passed into law without a huge sort of controversy. And then uh, disability rights uh, leaders worked with the Office of Health, Education, and Welfare, which was assigned to issue the regulations that would describe how this, um, this clause was going to be implemented. Uh, and they began to wait and wait to see this, um, the regulations get signed and take effect. And by 1977, um, people were fed up, and there were 10 protests all around this country. Um, to uh, at health education and welfare offices to see the Section 504 regulations be signed uh, by disabled activists and their allies. In San Francisco, a number of factors um, came together to allow the protest to, to thrive, whereas all the others fizzled out within 24 hours. And uh, 150 disabled people and their allies um, occupied a federal building in downtown San Francisco. And the occupation was 26 days long. It was uh, the longest occupation of a federal building by any group at that time. Now that Oregon thing that happened, 
yeah. messed it up for us mid, you know, while we're still running these events. So now we say unarmed occupation. It is the longest unarmed <laughs> occupation by any group to date. Um, so we just knew this was a great San Francisco story that hadn't been told. Uh, and when it had been told, uh, there was really little uh, attention to the fact that there were a lot of underrepresented groups. This was a really diverse collective. There were a lot of people's stories that hadn't been heard, and we set out to tell those stories. Um, so we had partnerships all across this campus that helped make it possible. We had uh, grant funding from the ORSP Collaborative Project um, and worked with uh, journalism professor Sachi Cunningham and uh, her one of her classes, and also a history lecturer, uh, Sue Englander, and we worked with students to collect 40 oral histories from people who are affiliated with this um, on video, and they're now all part of DIVA, as well as on our traveling exhibit, I mean, uh, our virtual exhibit. Um, so many of the people who told their stories said that they really thought that they might pass away before getting to tell somebody this story. And um, we actually have already lost some of the people whose stories that we captured. So it was an amazing project and really amazing for those students to get to be part of it and meet these activists. Um, we then took those, uh, the footage from that and turned it into 11 thematic videos that are on our virtual website and also were part of the main exhibit that we built. Um, then we worked with uh, faculty Pino Trogu and Sylvan Lin in design and industry and uh, created a, a, a main exhibit at the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, which ran for seven months. Um, so Sylvan Lin did a lot of the interactive features. We had a bullhorn you could yell into and a webcam. And we asked people to say, well, what, are you, what would you be patient no more about? That was the name of the exhibit. So trying to sort of think about carrying activism forward, which is especially important right now. Um, and we had 22 design and industry interns who worked on that process, worked on prototyping, worked with people in the disabled community who told us, this doesn't work with me, it would work for me, this font needs to be bigger. Um, all sorts of things of just getting our hands dirty and really learning as a group. Um, and then we had, uh, we worked with, thanks to Ed Luby, we had a lecturer in museum studies who had a class devoted to helping us build the traveling version of this exhibit. So we built a virtual exhibit, a main exhibit, and a traveling exhibit. Um, the traveling exhibit had funding from Cal Humanities. Um, and the, the museum studies students thought through everything from potential sites to educational curriculum to the actual design of the, um, the, the kiosks that we developed. Um, we made a extremely accessible uh, product. Everything was very, very accessible, and, and one of the works or things that has come out of this is now that we, we've done some consulting of talking about you know how to how to push museums to be more accessible. Um, the main exhibit had a seven-month run and was seen by over 10,000 people, and is going to reopen at the San Francisco Main Public Library in June through September. Uh, so we're getting ready for that, which is especially exciting because this is the 40th anniversary of this 1977 protest now, and the SF Main Public Library is across the street from the building where they occupied. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get the exhibit in there. I took one step in there and said, oh, there's this great history of activism. People occupied this building, and I was surrounded by security, and that's as far as we've gotten of making progress in that building, but we'll, we'll settle for across the street. Um, our traveling exhibit has seen over 13 locations, is currently on display at uh, JFK University over in Berkeley, um, and has all kinds of exciting stops on the, on the horizon. Um, some of the locations it's gone to previously are City Hall uh, in San Francisco. It launched at SF State's campus. It's been at other Cal State campuses, um, at community, or, um, uh, uh, county offices of education, uh, th all throughout California, but it will be traveling even further. The Arkansas State, State Capitol is going to host our traveling exhibit rather randomly. Um, and our virtual exhibit is being used in classrooms all over. We've developed an educational curriculum that goes with it. And we've given over a thousand uh, field trips to over a thousand students, um, both San Francisco State, uh, State students. Thank you to many of the professors, some may be here, who've welcomed us in the classroom to share this story. Um, and also uh, K through 12 um, uh, classrooms as well. Uh, just to share a sort of impact story of what this has looked like when we've got to share this story with students. We always have this little dance that happens. Um, it, it happened recently, we lectured in a health education class and a student came up at the end and her name was Fatima and she was almost in tears 
and she, you know, she kind of wanted to wait until the other students left, but she said, I have a 504 plan. I've heard that number my whole life. I had no idea about the history that went into it, and I always assumed that was something that the government just handed down. So to know that disabled people occupied a building to fight for me to have that right makes me feel that much more powerful in sort of demanding my access needs when they aren't met and being an advocate for myself. So that's just a really exciting example of how much this story has mattered bringing it on San Francisco State's campus to a wider community and also highlighting and, and giving the attention to the community that did this in 1977, which really deserved more attention than they had previously received. So um, I invite you to learn more about the exhibit at patientnomore.org. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities coming up for also bringing it into your classrooms if you're interested. Thank you. Anything to add? to all of our speakers. I would like to invite you up to the five chairs that we have up here. And in the interest of time, so that clock is two minutes fast, just FYI. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, what I would really like is if we could just have one question per, um, per speaker or speaker group. Um, and then we can continue the conversation at the reception as well as giving the TLC um, feedback on the teaching and learning commons. Um, so uh, we'll start out with just anyone's question, but we'll keep, try to keep it to one question per presenter. Are you willing to have me throw this at you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's kind of Oh, I have to speak in here? <laughs> Woo! Woo, it works. Okay. Uh, it's Connie Ulaswitz. So I have a question for Kathy. And um, my question for Kathy is, first of all, thank you for bringing to the table uh, Runway 2017. And I know at this point in time, we're challenged with the idea of having people from our community come forward that want to, and I'm using the word uh, part model, but it's also participate. Why do you think that is? Why are we having trouble? Yeah. Um, I think part of it's timing. That's really, I think um, we got the call out right before the holidays and so, and then the election, and I think everybody's kind of preoccupied. I, I'm not super worried. I think we will find people. Um, but I think, I also think people are a little uncertain, you know, if you're in the community in general, um, you know, what does it mean to go and be a model for a, a program at a campus? And I think this is a bigger, it raises a bigger issue for everybody in this room yes. that wants to have community involvement is, you know, what is that bridge that you need to build with the um, general public and the community at large? So um, I'm not worried. I think I really do chalk this one up a lot to timing. So, um, but we can talk more. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the sharing the idea on the words. Yeah. Where to throw? <laughs> okay. Is there another question? This is fun. Okay. So, Christina, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the certificate program in conflict resolution and how staff and faculty might get involved in that. That's a very interesting question. Um, the co conflict resolution certificate program is an interdisciplinary certificate that uh, is focused towards undergraduate students. Um, and uh, it's depending upon which classes that you take. Uh, it's about seven to eight classes. And um, I think it's really valuable. People do it as sort of um, an add-on, obviously, to your major or minor. Um, we are thinking about and working toward doing something that's more graduate focused as well. Um, I love your question about how can people, especially faculty, get involved. Um, I, I would encourage students to look through the courses on their certificate of course because it's always great to have students as a part of the program. But um, if faculty teach courses that they think might be relevant um, for somebody interested in, in doing uh, work in conflict resolution or conflict management and, and across all disciplines, so I mean we have every college represented, then um, I would say please let me know. 
know because uh, our, our coursework is changing all the time. People are proposing new courses. People are changing the way that they approach in terms of teaching. And so um, the more we get people involved, uh, the more opportunities we have for people. It'd be great. Thanks. Any other? Just to follow up on that question, I mean, it seems as faculty member, I would love to take the class classes, <laughs> and I don't quite have six courses at a time where I choose, let's say it's always a choice. Uh, is it possible to develop a kind of seminar program for faculty members? Because that would be great to me. That sounds amazing, and I think that's one of the things that, um, maybe not seminar program, but one of the things that uh, the Senate uh, really wanted to work on this year and that we've uh, talked to some communication studies faculty about helping us with is thinking about how do we help folks develop skill sets? How do we help people think about those questions in a way that they can really apply and that obviously doesn't take uh, six six course wor courses worth of, of work? Yeah. It takes practice. It does, absolutely. Yeah. Can I follow up? <laughs> and if that's something you're interested in in terms of programming for the <laughs> teaching and learning commons, Please come to the dessert reception and write that as one of your answers to one of the prompts there. I, I actually think it would be a, a great uh, type of programming for the TLC. And so we're thinking about it. But if I get a lot of feedback about that, that would also be really good information. So we have time for two more questions. So if I don't have a question for me, can I have a question for everybody else? <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so as I look at this audience, um, you know, I see this, you know, some of the same faces I've seen a lot. And, and, and uh, it, you know, it doesn't look like our students. So um, why is that? I mean, I know we have other faculty. I mean, why, 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 why is that? Just to say out loud, mostly women, right? And, you know, mm, maybe not so many underrepresented minorities. Um, so why is that? Yes, box. You know, I was really interested about your your flow chart about why other faculty didn't come. And for me, it's the same thing. It's a sense of belonging to San Francisco State and our our, our faculty identity at San Francisco State. So I feel um, the more we feel like we're faculty who belong to San Francisco State, then we participate more. Um, and for, that's how I feel, I think. Uh, the greater my sense of belonging here, the greater I feel like I really am a faculty member, then I'd participate more. Good job. Uh, I think one more, we have time for one more. Not to put pressure on anyone. They want dessert. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. dessert. Okay, I think that the silence means maybe we want dessert, but let's thank all of our presenters one more time.